by Rebecca Yaros. A fan-made adaptation produced and narrated by Maddie Morgan and featuring a full cast. This adaptation is for fun and fandom only, not for profit. The Empyrean series and its characters belong to the brilliant Rebecca Yaros. Welcome to the Fourth Wing. Chapter 5 Knowing I am in direct disagreement with General Melgren's orders, I am officially objecting to the plan set forth in today's briefing. It is not this general's opinion that the children of the rebellion's leaders should be forced to witness their parents' executions. No child should watch their parent put to death. The Tyrish Rebellion An Official Brief for King Tari by General Lilith Soringale Welcome to your first battle brief. Professor Devra says from the recessed floor of the enormous lecture hall later in the morning. This is the only class held in the circular room that curves the entire end of the academic hall, and one of only two rooms in the Citadel capable of fitting every cadet. Every creaky wooden seat is full, but we all fit. In the past, riders have seldom been called into service before graduation. And if they were, they were always third years who'd spent time shadowing forward wings. But we expect you to graduate with the full knowledge of what we're up against. Devra continues, pacing slowly in front of a 20-foot high map of the continent mounted to the back wall, intricately labeled with our defense outposts along our borders. She takes her time, making eye contact with every first year she sees. You need to understand the politics of our enemies, the strategies of defending our outposts from constant attack, and have a thorough knowledge of both recent and current battles. If you cannot grasp these basic topics, then you have no business on the back of a dragon. No pressure. Rhiannon mutters at my side, furiously taking notes. This is the only class you will have every day, because it's the only class that will matter if you're called into service early. Devra's gaze lands on me. Her eyes flare wide for a heartbeat but she gives an approving smile and nods before moving on. Because this class is taught every day and relies on the most current information, you will also answer to Professor Markham, who deserves nothing but your utmost respect. <gasps> Professor Markham? She waves the scribe forward, then leans in and says something to him. His head whips in my direction. There's no approving smile in his eyes. Just heavy sorrow. I was supposed to be his star pupil in the scribe quadrant. His crowning achievement before he retires. But here we are. He tears his disappointed gaze from mine. It is the duty of the scribes, not only to study and master the past, but to relay and record the present. Without accurate depictions of our front lines, reliable information with which to make strategic decisions, and, most importantly, voracious details to document our history for the good of future generations, we're doomed. Not only as a kingdom, but as a society. <sighs> which is exactly why I've always wanted to be a scribe. Not that it matters now. First topic of the day. The Eastern Wing experienced an attack last night near the village of Takir by a drift of bravey griffins and riders. Oh, shit. I dip my quill into the ink pot on my desk in front of me so I can take notes. I can't wait to channel so I can use the kind of coveted pens mom keeps on her desk. There could definitely be perks to being a writer. There will be. Naturally, some information is redacted for security purposes, but what we can tell you is that the wards faltered along the top of the Esben Mountains. Devra pulls her hands apart and the light expands, illuminating the mountains that form our border with Breivik on the map. Allowing the drift not only to enter Navarian territory, but for their riders to channel and wield sometime around midnight. My stomach sinks. 
Dragons aren't the only animals capable of channeling powers to their riders. Griffins from Poramil also share the ability, but dragons are the only ones capable of powering the wards that make all other magic but their own impossible within our borders. Without those wards, we're fucked. It would be open season on Navarian villages when the raiding parties from Poramil inevitably descend. Those greedy assholes are never content with the resources they have. They always want ours, too. And until they learn to be content with our trade agreements, we have no chance of ending conscription in Navarre. No chance of experiencing peace. But if we're not on high alert, then they must have gotten the wards rewoven, or at least stabilized. 37 civilians were killed in the attack in the hour before a squad from the Eastern Wing could arrive but the Riders and Dragons managed to repel the drift. Based on that information, what questions would you ask? I only want answers from first years to start. Well, my initial question would be why the hell the wards faltered. But it's not like they're going to answer a question like that in a room full of cadets with zero security clearance. So, I study the map. The Esben Mountain Range is the highest along our eastern border with Breivik making it the least likely place for an attack, especially since griffins don't tolerate altitude nearly as well as dragons do, probably due to the fact that they're half lion, half eagle, and can't handle the thinner air at higher altitudes. There's a reason we've been able to fend off every major assault on our territory and successfully defend our land in this never-ending 400-year-long war. Our abilities, both lesser and signet, are superior, because our dragons can channel more power than their griffins. So why attack in that mountain range? What caused the wards to falter there? Come on, first year, show me you have the critical thinking skills to be here. Is this the first time the wards have failed? A first year a couple of rows ahead asks. Professors Devra and Markham share a look before she turns back to the cadet. No. It isn't the first time? <clears throat> and how often are they faltering? That's above your pay grade, cadet. Next relevant question to the attack we're discussing. How many casualties did the wing suffer? One injured dragon, one dead rider. Why would you ask that particular question? To know how many reinforcements they'll need. Devra nods turning toward Pryor, the meekest first year in our squad, who has his hand up, but he lowers it quickly. Did you want to ask a question? Y yes. No, never mind. <laughs> so decisive. <laughs> Luca, a catty first year in our squad, I'll do just about anything to avoid, mocks from next to him. He's in our squad. Arlie, at least I think that's her name, chastises, her no-nonsense black eyes narrowing on Luca. Show some loyalty. Please. No dragon is bonding to a guy who can't even decide if he wants to ask a question. Did you see him at breakfast this morning? He held the entire lineup because he couldn't choose between bacon and sausage. I do have questions to ask, but especially after Dane's advice yesterday, I want to stay anonymous as long as possible. I whispered at just Rhiannon. Ask what altitude the village is at. What? Just ask. What altitude is the village at? Devra's eyebrows rise. Markham? A little less than 10,000 feet. Why? Rhiannon darts a dose of side-eye at me, then clears her throat. <laughs> just seems a little high for a planned attack with griffins. Good job. It is a little high for a planned attack. Why don't you tell me why that's bothersome, Cadet Sorengale? And maybe you'd like to ask your own questions from here on out. Every head in the room turns in my direction. Awesome. Griffins aren't as strong at that altitude, and neither is their ability to channel, so it's an illogical place for them to attack. Unless they knew the wards would fail. Especially since the village looks to be, what, an hour's flight from the nearest outpost? I glance at the map to be sure I'm not making a fool of myself. That is Chakir right there, isn't it? It is. 
keep going with that line of thought. Wait a second. Didn't you say it took an hour for the squad of riders to arrive? I did. Then they were already on their way. Um. <laughs> yeah, because that makes sense. Oh, great. Jack Barlow turns around from his seat in the front row. General Melgren knows the outcome of a battle before it happens, but even he doesn't know when it'll happen, dumbass. I want to crawl under my desk and disappear. <laughs> Fuck off, Barlow. I'm not the one who thinks precognition is a thing. <laughs> Why do you think that, Violet? He winces. Cadet Sorengale. Because there's no logical way they get there within an hour of the attack unless they were already on their way. I argue. Shooting a glare at Jack. <laughs> it would take at least half that long just to light the beacons in the range and call for help. And it's not like any squad is just sitting around waiting to be needed. It only makes sense if they were already on their way. And why would they already be on their way? Devra prods. And the light in her eyes tells me I'm right. I lift my chin, even as I send a small prayer to Dune, the goddess of war, that I'm wrong. Because they somehow knew the wards were breaking. That is the most ridiculous. She's right. One of the dragons in the wing sensed the faltering ward, and the wing flew. Had they not, the casualties would have been far higher, and the destruction of the village much worse. Huh. How about that? Second and third years take over. Let's see if you can be a little more respectful to your fellow cadets. Mm -hmm. She arches a brow at Jack as questions begin to fire off from the riders behind us. Were any left alive for questioning? How many riders were deployed to the site? What killed the lone fatality? How long did it take to clear the village of griffins? I write down every question and answer, my mind organizing the facts into what kind of report I would have filed if I'd been in the scribe quadrant. What information was important enough to include? What was what extraneous? What was the condition of the village? The hair on the back of my neck stands up. Ryerson. The village. Professor Devera said the damage would have been worse, but what was the actual condition? Was it burned? Destroyed? They wouldn't demolish it if they were trying to establish a foothold, so the condition of the village matters when trying to determine a motive for the attack. Well... Devra smiles in approval. The buildings they'd already gone through were burned, and the rest were being looted when the wing arrived. They were looking for something. And it wasn't riches. That's not a gem mining district. Which begs the question, what do we have that they want so badly? Exactly. That's the question. And that right there is why Ryerson is a wing leader. You need more than strength and courage to be a good rider. Tomorrow, next week, next month, there will be another attack. And maybe we'll get another clue. In this class, we want you to learn which questions to ask. So all of you have a chance at coming home alive. You seriously knew every answer in history and apparently every right question to ask in Battle Brief, Rhiannon says, shaking her head as we stand on the sidelines of the sparring mat, watching Riddick and Aurelie circle each other in their fighting leathers. Ah, you're not even going to have to study for the tests, are you? Well, I was trained as a scribe. I shrug, and the vest Mira made me shimmer slightly with the movement. It fits right in with the tops we'd been given from Central Issue yesterday. All the women are dressed similarly today, though the cuts of their leathers are chosen by preference. The guys are mostly shirtless because they think shirts <clears throat> give their opponent something to grab onto. Personally, I'm not arguing with their logic, just enjoying the view. Respectfully, of course, which means keeping my eyes on my own squad's mat and off the other 20 mats in the gym. There are three squads from each wing here this afternoon, and lucky me, first wing has sent their third squads, which include Jack Barlow, who's been glaring at me from two mats over ever since walking in. Stop circling each other like your dance partners. 
And attack. Professor Emeterio orders from across the mat, where Dane watches Aurelie and Riddick's match with our squad executive leader, Sienna. Thank God Dane's shirt is on, because I do not need another distraction when it's my turn on the mat. Rhiannon's chosen a leather vest today too, but hers cuts in above the collarbone and secures at her neck, leaving her shoulders bare for movement. Guess that means you're not worried about academics. I'm worried about this. I tilt my chin toward the mat. Really? She shoots me a skeptical look. I figured as a Sorengale, you'd be a hand-to-hand threat. Not exactly. (laughs) Riddick launches toward Aurelie, but she ducks, sweeping out her leg and tripping him. (laughs) He pivots quickly and draws a dagger. No blades today. Emeterio chastises from the side of the mat. We're just assessing. Riddick grumbles and sheathes his knife, just in time to deflect a right hook from Aurelie. He lands a jab to her ribs. Oh, shit. I don't want to hurt you. Aurelie holds her ribs, but lifts her chin. Who said you hurt me? Pulling your punches does her a disservice. Dane says, folding his arms. The Signies on the northeast border aren't going to give her any quarter because she's a woman if she falls from her dragon behind enemy lines. Riddick, they'll kill her just the same. Let's go. Arlie beckons Riddick by curling her fingers. It's obvious that most cadets have trained their whole lives to get to the quadrant. Especially Arlie, who slips a jab from Riddick and gets a good shot at his kidneys. (laughs) Ouch. I mean, damn. She turns back to me. I'm pretty good on the mat. My village is on the Cygnuson border, so we all learn to defend ourselves fairly young. Physics and math aren't problems either. But history? Mm. That class might be the death of me. Riddick charges Aurelie, <laughs> taking her to the mat with enough force to make me wince. She hooks her legs around his and somehow leverages him over until she's the one on top, landing punch after punch to the side of his face. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably gonna die on these mats. I could probably offer some tips to survive combat training. Sawyer says from Rhiannon's other side, (laughs) running his hand over a day's growth of brown stubble that doesn't quite cover his freckles. History isn't my strongest subject, though. (laughs) Ooh, his tooth just went flying. Enough. Aurelie rolls off Riddick and stands, touching her fingers to her split lip and examining the blood, then offers her hand to help him up. He takes it. Sienna, take Riddick to the healers. No reason to lose a tooth during assessment. Let's make a deal, Rhiannon says, locking her brown eyes with mine. Let's help each other out. We'll help you with hand-to-hand if you help us with history. Sound like a deal, Sawyer? Absolutely. Deal. But I think I'm getting the better end of that. You haven't seen me try to memorize dates. (laughs) 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 The sound comes from a couple mats over, and we all turn to look. Jack Barlow has another first year in a headlock. That guy is such an asshole. Sweet Malik. What did I say? You broke his damn neck. How was I supposed to know his neck was that weak? His promise from yesterday slithers through my memory. You're dead, Sorengale, and I'm going to be the one to kill you. Eyes forward. And material orders, and we all look away from the dead first year. You don't have to get used to it, but you do have to function through it. You and you. He points to Rhiannon and another first year in our squad. A man with a stocky build, blue-black hair, and angular features. Oh shit, I can't remember his name. Trevor... Thomas, maybe? Whatever his name is, Rhiannon's making quick work of him, stunning me every time she dodges a punch and then lands one of her own. (laughs) She's fast. (laughs) And her hits are powerful. She takes him to his back, her hand stopped mid-hit just above his throat. (sighs) Do you yield? (sighs) No. He hooks his legs around Rhiannon's and slams her to her back. (laughs) But she rolls and quickly gains her feet before putting him in the same position again, this time with her boot to his neck. Tanner? I'm pretty sure his name starts with a T. 
I don't know, Tynan. You might want to yield. <sighs> oh, Tynan. That's right. She's handing you your ass. Fuck off, Ada. <laughs> <laughs> Rihanna presses her boot into his throat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tynan has more ego than common sense. <laughs> He yields. And Material calls it, and Rhiannon gets up, offering Tynan her hand. He takes it. You? And Material points to the pink-haired second year with the rebellion relic. And you. His finger swings to me. You've got this. Rhiannon taps my shoulder as she passes me. The thing is, though, Rhiannon has no idea how much I do not got this. My physical disadvantage was already going to make this hard, but to make it even worse, she's got a rebellion relic. All the marked ones blame my mother for the execution of their rebel parents. My pink-haired opponent looks me over like I'm something she scraped off the side of her boot, so she probably feels the same. The Sorengale Runt. You really should dye your hair if you don't want everyone to know who your mother is. You're the only silver-haired freak in the quadrant. Never said I cared if everyone knows who my mother is. But even if I did, I'm proud of her service to defend our kingdom. You bitch. Your mother murdered my family. Aww. Whoa. She lunges forward and swings wildly. I quickly sidestep. She misses me again, but her foot flies at my head. I easily duck, but then she drops to the ground and kicks out with her other foot, which lands square in my chest. I hit the mat with a thud, and she's already above me so damn fast. You can't use your powers in here, Imogen. <laughs> Imogen is trying her best to kill me. I feel the quick slide of something hard against my ribs. We both look down to see a dagger being sheathed into a pocket of my new vest. Mira's armor just saved my life. Confusion mars Imogen's face for just a second, long enough for me to send my fist into her cheek and roll out from under her. My hand screams with pain, even though I'm sure I formed the fist right, but I block it out as we both gain our feet. What kind of armor is that? It's mine. Her movements are a blur, and then she catches me, taking me to the floor. Her knee digs into my back as she pulls my right arm behind me. Yield! No! Yield! She pulls my arm farther, and the pain consumes every thought. The ligaments stretch, shred, then pop. Yield! Yield, Violet! Imogen! Yield! I turn my face to the side as she wrenches my shoulder apart. She yields. That's enough. There it is again. The sound of snapping bone. But this time, it's fine. <laughs>